Sorry about that. So yesterday, uh, over the last two lectures, I've been talking to you about black holes. We first did uh, some elements of the theory of black holes. And uh, after that, we considered stellar mass black holes, meaning how are they formed and, uh, and uh, how do we find them? So we, uh, I told you that there are two ways of finding them. One is look for sources like X-ray binaries, and the other one was look for gravitational waves. And uh, the gravitational wave detection is very recent, and it has opened out a completely new uh, part of the black hole mass spectrum, a completely unexpected part. Now I'm going to go to supermassive black holes. So there are the intermediate blast mass black holes, which go from about 100 to about 10 to the 5 solar masses. And the supermassive black holes are going from about a million solar masses to about 10 to the 9 solar masses. So uh, I'll mostly consider the supermassive black holes, but much of what I say will also apply to the other ones. They are only smaller in scales. They are also found in galaxies. So um, then uh, after I finished with uh, the, the black holes, supermassive black holes, if I got a little bit of time, uh, then I could talk about just a few slides about the singularity theorems, which are so important in the theory of black holes. Number one and number two, uh, some exotic things like multiple connected uh, 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 the regions of space-time and so on. But uh, that is just to mention it. and. Uh, not with any degree of uh, detail or seriousness. So first, uh, I wish to bring to your notice some scales which are involved. Uh, because when we talk about astrophysical objects, we should know how large they are and what are the characteristic numbers we define them. And there's something which we have talked about at length, the Schwarzschild radius, which is 2 gm by z squared. And I already told you that in terms of the solar mass, this could be written as 3 to 10 to the 8, um, m upon 10 raised to 8 solar mass kilometers. An expression like this is very convenient uh, because if you've got a black hole of 10 to the 7 solar masses, you can very easily see what its Schwarzschild radius should be. Right? Then uh, there is something called the radius of influence. So the idea is that how far can the black hole uh, influence uh, stars around it, because we are now going to be talking about black holes in galaxies. So the stars in the galaxy, and uh, if you have if you have got a black hole in the center of the Milky Way galaxy, uh, could it uh, could it affect stars which are very far away? For example, the sun is at twenty eight thousand kilo. Uh, is at, no, I'm sorry, the sun is at about eight kiloparsec, uh, uh, about twenty four thousand light years away from the center. So can a black hole uh, at the center of the galaxy uh, uh, affect it? So the general principle is that the, the, the radius of influence is given by g m by c square, meaning that m is the mass of the black hole, as usual, and c square is the dispersion velocity of the stars around it. So you can say uh, in a simple way that if the stars are moving very fast, then the black hole is going to be able to affect it much less. If the stars are moving slowly, then the black hole can affect it more and its radius of influence will increase. And so this distance for a 10 to the 8 solar mass black hole at a dispersion velocity of 200 kilometers per second is about 11.2 parsec. Then there's a very important concept called Eddington luminosity. So if, if you are in the room, in this room where I'm giving a talk, and then I could ask you whether have you been introduced to this concept, and you would have said yes or no. Unfortunately, I can't do that now. So let me uh, do that very, very quickly. So just imagine an object like the sun. Uh, you see that the sun has got a hot gas in it, and if you take a little bit of material in the body of the sun, then it will have two forces acting on. One is the inward force due to gravity, and then there is the outward force uh, due to the pressure of the gas. And these two are in exact equilibrium, and which is why the sun survives with uh, more or less the same radius for billions of years. 
so there's an equilibrium between gravity and uh, gravity and the uh, uh, outward pressure which is because of the the fact that the gas is hot now uh, imagine the situation where the a star like the sun becomes more and more luminous so as the luminosity increases there is a amount of energy radiant energy which is emitted per second increases then the radiation density will be high inside and as you know radiation which has got a density of u let's say u earth per centimeter cube or whatever uh, then uh, then the pressure will be p is equal to u by 3 let's say you know that from the lipman theory so if i get therefore if i get what's okay so if i get uh, you can imagine the situation when as a star becomes more and more massive uh, it will radiate more and more that is because the luminosity of a star goes as a high power of the mass it can go as mass to the cube or mass to the four or whatever so therefore as the mass increases the luminosity increases and as the luminosity increases the outward pressure increases at some point when the mass is large enough then the outward pressure uh, uh, due to the radiation can dominate the outward pressure due to the uh, gas so such an object you can consider an equilibrium of an object where the force of gravity is entirely balanced by the outward pressure of the radiation and when you do that uh, you find that there is a maximum luminosity which was first thought of by arthur eddington who was a great astrophysicist of the first half of the 20th century uh, so l eddington is equal to 4 pi c g m m p uh, m is the mass of the object all the other quantities here are fundamental constants sigma t is the thomson scattering cross section so if you put in all these numbers you will find that an object which has got a mass of 10 to the 8 solar masses has got an eddington luminosity of 10 to the 46 arc per second so what is the meaning of this is that if you uh, you will find that quasars have uh, have very high luminosity they could they could they can have luminosity 10 to the 46 10 to the 47 10 to the 48 arcs per second but the point is that a, a mass which is only 10 to the 8 solar masses cannot have a luminosity higher than 10 to the 46 arcs per second because at this luminosity the matter in the star will be essentially blown up so um, whereas if this what happens if the solar mass object f is equal to 1 Then this will become 10 to the 38, and the X-ray binaries which I mentioned to you yesterday, they have an eddington luminosity at about 10 to the 38 hertz per second, and that indeed is the luminosity of many of these X-ray binaries. So now imagine an object <coughs> which is radiating at the eddington luminosity. Now all radiation like that comes from the conversion of mass to energy, essentially. So L eddington is I can write it as m dot to the rate of conversion of mass to energy times c square. This is just Einstein's fundamental equation, and epsilon, which is um, <coughs> which is um, uh, which is an efficiency factor. Because even though you are converting mass, all of it is not converted to radiation. I told you yesterday that, for example, that the efficiency in nuclear energy emission, nuclear fusion, is about 0.7 percent. So you you see here, L eddington therefore can be written as epsilon to the dot times c square, and you can now define an eddington time scale, which is the mass of the object divided by the rate at which the object is radiating at eddington luminosity. Okay, so so if this is point one, then you will get ten to the seven years and so. I mean, it is possible that I may use some numbers. Okay, now. Uh, you will be learning about galaxies and that there are different kinds of galaxies which are summarized here in uh, in this hubble tunic 4 diagram where uh, you have got at the at the foot of the tunic 4 you have nearly spherical galaxies as you go along the foot you get more and more elliptical galaxies and then here along one arm of the fork you have got the spiral galaxies and the other arm arm of the fork you have got the barred spiral galaxies and where at the confluence we get galaxies which are like the spiral galaxies in the sense that they got a disk but but they are no spiral arms and then you have got 
uh, and it, the, the, the bulge is very much like a large, like, a, like an elliptical galaxy. And so now it turns out all the galaxies in our neighborhood, which we have been able to survey, uh, has got a supermassive black hole in it. Meaning that it has got a black hole, which has got a mass of about 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 solar masses. The really uh, uh, massive black holes, they are in the more distant galaxies. Right? So, so these are all normal galaxies, okay, in the sense that they, uh, if you look at the emission which comes from a galaxy like this, so our, uh, our elliptical, our Milky Way galaxy is like this, like I said, and if you look at the uh, energy coming from it, it is due to the energy which is emitted by the individual stars in the galaxy. There's also energy which is emitted by a gas, uh, you know, there's all kinds of gas which is present. There's also energy which is emitted by the occasional supernovae and planetary nebulae and so forth. But the steady state energy is the one which is coming from the stars. So because the sun is a very average star, we say that it has got an energy of about 10 to the 33 Earths per second. And then we consider uh, uh, 10 to the 33 Earths per second. Uh, and then they, let's say that there are 10 raised to 11 stars in a large galaxy, then you are talking of 10 to the 44 Earths per second. And uh, galaxies which do this, the stars emit most of the radiation, are known as normal galaxies. Now, there are, uh, as you again will hear, uh, there are uh, all these stupendous radio structures in the sky. And these are uh, typically, uh, they are the kind of thing which will be observed by the GMRT. So typically, they have got uh, the first ones which are discovered by Jenison and Das Gupta in, I think, in the early 50s. They discovered just two lobes. But now, this is a more recent one, though, though quite old, actually. Uh, so you see that you've got a nucleus and you've got the jets coming out and uh, you have uh, these wonderful lobes which are there. And it's quite, it is understood now that energy which is being produced in the central nucleus is going through these jets and he's feeding the galaxy, and he's feeding the lobes. Now, these, these, radio, these radio structures are associated with galaxies. So, for example, you've got a galaxy called this, uh, the Sene, the radio source Sene, uh, is associated with a galaxy which is called uh, NGC 5128. Okay, this is the official name of the galaxy, and uh, it is in the constellation of Centaurus, and it's a lenticular galaxy, and uh, it is the closest radio galaxy to the Earth, a distance of 3.5 megaparsec. So now the question is, now if you look at the energy which is emitted by the radio lobes, it can be far larger than the amount of energy which is emitted by the stars in the galaxy. So galaxies like this, which where the radiation is dominated, the radiation is non still the dominant part of the radiation, are known as active galaxies. And so the question is, where does the energy of the active galaxies come from? And uh, these active galaxies were first discovered at quasars, were discovered in the 1960s, 1950s, but they were not understood at that time that they were galaxies, the radio sources. And then in 1961, 1963, uh, Martin Schmidt uh, discovered the first quasar. Uh, and then, then the list went on expanding. So these galaxies are called active galaxies. The, their luminosity is can go up to 10 to the 47, 10 to the 48 Earths. And uh, the most extreme kind of active galaxies are the quasars. So you see that these quasars, at the center of the thing, this optical image of a quasar, you see a quasar, and next to it is a star. Now, um, the spikes that you see in, in a star, typically in an image like this, are, um, um, are what are called, they are because they are the diffraction spikes because of this telescope structure. So when you get spikes like this, it means that the source from which the radiation is arising is actually a point source. It appears to have a finite radius because of the spreading of the atmosphere. So here you have got an object which looks exactly like a star, so which must be point source, uh, with a point source, but it would be uh, it would be emitting energy. A star is 10 to the 33 Earth per second, then this would be emitting 10 to the 47 Earth per second. So how can a compact object, uh, which is uh, emit so much energy? Now, as, as properties of quasars were discovered, properties of active galaxies were discovered, it was found that they, the spectrum, the spectrum of a galaxy has absorption lines largely. 
but the spectrum of a quasar has got emission lines, as you see here. And the presence of the emission lines, uh, presence of the emission line means that um, that there is again something which is exciting the gas in the galaxy, a very big source of energy. And uh, other uh, sign that something extraordinary going on is a very rapid variability. So if you see, uh, if you see things here, uh, if you see uh, that there's a look at the intensity which is coming from the object. I'm sorry, I have to change my specs. I can't see the screen. So if you look at the intensity coming from the object, you see that it varies for a time scale of days. But there are quasars in which you can have intensity vary in a time scale, uh, much, much shorter time scales. Right? So, um, so now uh, let us see what is the meaning of such a rapid variability. Let us suppose that you have got uh, a variability of the time scale tau. So you can have the variability as short as 100 seconds. Okay, then it means that the radius of the object, uh, it has to be less than three into 10 to the 12, tau per 100 seconds into centimeters. So for an object which varies at 100 seconds, so you would get a uh, radius, uh, so you would have a radius which is less than three to 10 to the 12 seconds. And that corresponds at a Schwarzschild radius uh, of about three to 10 to the 12 centimeters corresponds to a mass of about 10 to the 7 solar masses. So why do we bring in the Schwarzschild radius here? So you've got a very compact object, and then you've got a very compact object, and then it is very, uh, how do I know it's compact? That's because it shows very rapid variation. And I know that it is emitting a great deal of energy. So people began to realize, Linden Bell, Donald Linden Bell and others, that it could be because of the accretion which is taking place Zeldovich and Novikov also were involved in this, and the accretion which is taking place onto a black hole is one possibility. And then, uh, if you want, uh, if you want the radius to be comparable to the Schwarzschild radius, then you need a mass of 10 to the seventh solar masses. But then there was another very interesting observation, which was actually first made by radio astronomers. Radio astronomers developed a technique called very large baseline interferometry. And using that, they could produce very, very high resolution uh, pictures of, uh, of the, the radio structures. And when they did that, they found that the radio structures were expanding very rapidly. Now, this is not a radio image. It's an optical image, uh, which is taken of, of a, a radio source called M87. I'll show you a slide of that in a moment. Uh, an optical image of that taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. So you've got these two structures which are uh, moving apart. So this is 1994, this is 1995, this is 1996. The structure is, of course, changing. Um, and then what you can do is that you know the distance to uh, this uh, source because you have the redshift and so forth. You know the distance to the source. So you have got a certain rate at which the angle is increasing between the two things. And then you can convert that to a distance, meaning that how fast is the distance between these two Increasing, meaning what is the speed with which these two objects are moving away from each other. And then you find, astonishingly, that speed is six times the speed of light. Right. So, so what is all this going on? And this is not the only source. So you can't say that you are making an observational error. Please go and do your calculations properly. Please do your observations properly. Because there are many sources which show this. And superluminal motion. Does it mean that the special theory of relativity doesn't any longer hold? And there were many different mechanisms which are produced for this. And the most elegant, the most simplest mechanism was suggested by Martin Rees, who was at that time a young student in Cambridge. And, um, and now, of course, he's Lord Martin Rees. Uh, he is one of the great astrophysicists of our time. So, so what did he suggest? And uh, this is a simplified version of that. Just imagine that there's one object which is sitting here, and it throws out another object at a great speed from it. Now, um, there is a pulse which is emitted by this object when it was here, and then there's a pulse which is emitted when it is here. So you see the fact is that by the time, so you, you are looking at the arrival time of pulses sitting on the Earth, and then that tells you, that allows you to decide what is the speed with which the thing is going away. And then it turns out that the apparent speed, this is here given as beta, the uh, VA by C, uh, and you find that that is equal to B 
sin psi upon 1 minus beta cos psi. Right, so it is, uh, so that is simply equal to, uh, where psi is this angle, the angle between our direction of the line of sight and the direction in which the, what the object is moving. So what you are seeing here, and then if, um, and how much is this apparent speed? You see that there's a plot here. If beta is equal to 0.96, meaning if the object is moving really fast, gamma is equal to five, uh, then depend, if the angle is small, uh, then you see that angle is about 15 degrees, you find that you get five times uh, the, the speed, the apparent speed is five times the speed of light. So, so what is most important here is that this is the apparent speed. So, so what Martin Rees pointed out is that it is just it is just fake, meaning that you are, you feel that it is so. Uh, that is because because of the great velocity of the object is going much closer towards you. There's also there's also a, 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 a related phenomenon is that if there are if there is an object thrown towards you and the object thrown away from you. Then the ratio of the fluxes of the objects, one which is moving towards you, one which is away towards you, again because of similar effects, is equal to one plus beta cos psi over one minus beta cos psi. And so what it means is that an object which is moving uh, at a small angle, these are to the line of sight, uh, the, the one which is moving towards you can appear to be 1600 times uh, brighter than the one which is moving away from you given that they both have intrinsic brightness. So what does this establish? It establishes that uh, that associated with all these objects, uh, all these phenomena are very high speeds and very great energies. And high speeds always require a deep potential well. And so it would mean that there's a supermassive object which is sitting inside. Right, so... Uh, I'm just trying to speed up a little bit. So, so now the question is, uh, the question is, just one moment, please. So the question is, how can we look, how can we search for this <coughs> supermassive objects? I mean, I have, I have many lines of thought which tell me that they must be there, but can I actually look for it? And I will give you <coughs> one exa two examples, one which comes from X-ray astronomy, and the other comes from observing the stars in the center of a galaxy. And this is the most remarkable observation, finding supermassive black holes in the center of a galaxy. The work was done by two groups, Genzel, one led by Genzel and the other led by Gez. Um, Genzel was in Germany and Gez was in the US. And uh, last year, they were awarded the Nobel Prize for this work. And so here is Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Gez. Right? So, so you see, there's a very beautiful picture of the of a Milky Way galaxy. You can actually see this from a reasonable observatory with your naked eyes. And um, here is a more complex picture. It is a, it's a near infrared image of the galaxy, and uh, it is made in the, it's a composite image uh, done by pointing your camera at different parts of the galaxy. And what you should see is that this reddish kind of a thing that you see here, and this is the dust which is present in the galaxy. Right. So, uh, so now, uh, now the idea is the following: is that given the proximity of a galaxy, do you see the sun is sitting somewhere here? about 8 kiloparsec from the center of the galaxy. And the question is, can I look, uh, if I assume that there was supermassive black hole in the galaxy, center of the galaxy, then it must be affecting the motion of the stars in the galaxy. And if that is true, uh, then can I use that motion to measure the mass of this central black hole? So what is the difficulty there? The difficulty is that, Stars which are in our vicinity, if you drag them as far as the center of the galaxy, that is 24,000 light years away, and then the stars will become much, much fainter. There's another problem, and that problem is the presence of this dust that you see. Because of the dust, the stars are absorbed. And therefore, uh, if you drag them to the center of the galaxy, then, uh, then they must have, uh, then their apparent brightness will go down by 30 magnitudes. Five magnitudes is a factor of 100. Okay, so 30 magnitudes is a factor of 10 to the 12. They become really, really faint uh, when you go down uh, 
uh, to a set of galaxy. So how do you solve this problem? The problem of faintness can be used by using very, very large telescopes. And the problem uh, of absorption can be used by going to near infrared. Because typically, uh, the amount of absorption goes as a power of one upon lambda, where lambda is the wavelength. So at, you've got the greatest observation at low wavelengths, like the blue and ultraviolet. And then as you go to higher wavelengths, it decreases. And particularly if you go to near infrared, that is the minimum thing. So why not go to infrared? The point is that you need the kind of equipment which can have a high resolution and which can, uh, where, you can uh, where you can resolve these objects. So you want a good camera. And those are all available at near infrared wavelengths for the past couple of decades, three decades or so. Right, so, so now this is a picture of the center of a galaxy, not in the optical, but at a, at a radio wavelength of 90 centimeters. And you see that there is a, there's a radio source here, uh, which is known as Sagittarius A. Because you see that the center of a galaxy is the constellation of Sagittarius, as you all know. And uh, because there's a radio source here, a tiny radio source. Now, uh, <coughs> this radio source, in this radio source, a, compli a, 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 a very compact component called Sagittarius A star was found with VLBI. There is very long baseline observations in 1974. And they named it A star because they thought that it was a star kind of a source, exciting source, right? And it is generally believed that A star is at the center of the galaxy. So uh, now, uh, how do you know the center of the galaxy? It is by analyzing the mass portions around it. But then you know that it is a set, gravitational center of the galaxy. And if it is, then that is the point at which you should be looking for a black hole. So now here is a black hole associated with Sagittarius A star. This is a very beautiful X-ray image taken uh, by the Chandra X-ray Observatory of Sagittarius A. And here you see Sagittarius A star, and you see a cloud of hot gas around it. Okay, so now uh, what you do is that these observations were carried out. The American group carried it out with the Keck telescope, the 10 meter, and then the German group carried them out with the European Southern Observatory telescopes, which are 8 meters. Back. And then they use HKL, just like you've got BVR. These are the bands in the optical. HKL are bright bands in the infrared. And then, in order to increase the resolution, uh, they use techniques which are known as speckle interferometry and adaptive optics. These observations were done uh, many years ago, 2003. Okay, so, but they are continuing even up to now, as I'll show you as I go along. And then you find here that uh, adaptive optics was uh, uh, just available at that time, so they did it. So I told you that the, the, the diameter of a galaxy is 100,000 light years, 30 kiloparsec. Right? So that is the size of the galaxy. And from there, uh, by using all the high resolution, if you look at these stars here at the center of the galaxy, and this bar here has got a scale of six light months. So here you're talking about four light months. So one light year would be about 100,000 10 to the minus 5 of our galaxy, size of our galaxy. So you're looking like a resolution about 10 to the minus 6 of our galaxy. Right? And you can see the individual stars there. And this is a, a very a beautiful zoom version of it. And uh, this object is Sagittarius A star. And the idea is now to look at the motion of these stars around it. And then you see doing, uh, here are the stars around Sagittarius A. And we are particularly interested in this star called S2, whose orbit has been followed for the last uh, 20 years or so. And so now, let see, the point is this. Uh, the sun takes a very long time to go around the center of the galaxy. Okay, so whereas the stars like this, uh, here they take a much, much shorter time. This is about 20 light years or so is the time that they quickly go around the stars in the galaxy. 20 years or so. So, which means that observers can actually see the star circling the center of the galaxy. Okay, and um, now um, to follow the stars year after year um, is incredibly difficult. That is because you need to have defined a coordinate system which can be held steady over all these years. And that is done by combining 
have radio observations with optical observations. Right? I have, unfortunately, I can't go into the details, which are very interesting. Uh, but what you can see here, finally, uh, is that these arrows show you the speed with which each one of these stars is moving. At this scale, is 500 kilometers per second. So the fast stars are moving very fast. I mean, this one like is moving 7,000 kilometers per second. And they are moving so fast. Typically, the motion in our galaxy, where we are, is like 200 kilometers per second. So they are moving so far because they are getting close to the black hole. And now look at this incredibly beautiful uh, uh, picture. So you have got Sagittarius A, which has been followed at uh, 1992 to 2002, 10-year period. And you see how beautifully the star, uh, the position of the star, is distributed along this best fit ellipse, which is here. And this should remind you of the amazing work which was done by Kepler 400 years ago. Because Kepler was given the data on the orbit of Mars uh, by his supervisor, Tycho Brahe, and he looked at the data, and then he, he, he could not use a wonderful laptop to make a plot like this, but he nevertheless managed to prove, it took him a very long time, uh, to prove uh, that the orbit, the shape of the orbit was that of an ellipse, with the sun sitting at the uh, sun sitting at one focus, and which is exactly what you have now. The orbit of the star S2 uh, is an ellipse, with Sagittarius A star sitting at one focus. So now this is, this is so we are exactly reproduced the results of Kepler for the solar system. But when Kepler was doing his work, Newton was not around. So Kepler had no way of uh, uh, determining the mass of this object. But we have Newton 300 years in our past. Kepler had him 100 years in his future. Right? So therefore, we can apply Newton's laws to get the mass of this object. And it turns out that the mass of the object is about uh, 3.7 into 10 to the 6 solar masses. Right? And this was the this was the result obtained in 2003. And the orbit is 15.2 years. And what is extremely important is that this distance, very strong, the, the closest distance of approach uh, to Sagittarius A star, the gravitating object there, uh, is only 17 light hours, okay, which is 0.6 milliparsec. Okay, so, uh, so you see that, so what, what that tells you, is that supposing the object here, this very massive object at the in the center of the galaxy, supposing it were extended object, and meaning that it uh, uh, <clears throat> then because of the extension of the object, the orbit would get perturbed. Because you see, for example, the sun has got a quadrupole. Okay, so which causes the orbit to change a little bit from a perfect elliptical shape. Okay, so that is what <clears throat> you get here. But the fact that it can approach so closely and yet you get such a good elliptical trajectory means that it must be a really, really compact object. Now, uh, now that was in 2003. And now here we are at a much later time, uh, which is uh, 2008. So what had happened by 2008 is that this particular orbit uh, has closed. In 2003, it had stopped here. In the next five years, the object has made its has to have made its way to close the object. So you would imagine that you would get a perfect ellipse. But it turns out, just look at this here. It is actually not a perfect ellipse. You can't just uh, pin it down to error bars and so forth. The error bars are very small here. So why is the orbit not exactly closing on itself? And it was believed that that was because, uh, you see this uh, thing here, the supermassive black hole Sagittarius A star? You'll see that uh, uh, this seems to have a slight elongation, and which means that the object is actually moving slightly. The point object which could be moving back and forth, back and forth slightly. And if it moves slightly, it will perturb the object so that the orbit is not closed. So that was the thought. And here, uh, there is uh, uh, one more thing. This is by the group, uh, this is Getzel's group. Uh, the, the, uh, the the blue ones are by the VLT data by the European group, and the red points are because of Keck data. And you see that the the American group did its work completely independently of the European group. And what is very very satisfactory 
is that the the points sit along the same ellipse, and you still see the same problem of the north overlap. Right, and that it is very reassuring that such difficult observations done by two different groups completely independently, uh, they, <coughs> they they actually deal with uh, they, they they agree with each other so well. Now I want to go back to Einstein's theory for a moment. And I told you that there are three predictions, gravitational redshift, the bending of light, and the precession of the perillion of Mercury. And why does Mercury, why is there a precession of the perillion of Mercury? It, there's a large amount of Mercury, like 500 arcs per century, uh, which is due to all the other planets and so forth. But then it turns out that uh, when, you, when you subtract out all the effects of the planets, you are left with a residual precession of 43 arc seconds per century. That's very tiny, 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 because a one degree is 3,600 arc seconds. So you've got only 43 arc seconds, and that also in 100 years. But the fact is that even in the 19th century, astronomical, astrometric observations were accurate enough for people to see that it is there. And once you have Einstein's theory, and when Einstein did his calculation in 1915, he was able to show that his theory fully explains that exact, fully and exactly explains this 43 arc seconds per century. And he did not have to introduce any new constant on it. He just came out from the theory. Right? So, so you see that now, um, over the years, so as we go to 2020, the accuracy with which the orbit of S2 has been measured has increased enormously. So here you are talking about an RMS uncertainty in milli arc seconds of about 100 milli arc seconds. Okay, no, this is about 10 milli arc seconds. Now, this is 10 to the 1, 10 to the 0, 10 to the minus 1. But the, the, a new instrument called gravity, which is the, uh, all the four, there are four VLTs and the beams have been uh, done. And the and RMS accuracy, which is um, reached, is more like 65 micro arc seconds. And so there is a, there's more than the factor of about 20 improvement over this one, more than that. Okay, and so this was done with a new instrument called gravity. And uh, when that was done, and then you see that this is the orbit which has been think here. And then the orbit has been different very exactly. And you see, first of all, the source and the focus. There is no longer consistency with this object moving. Okay, so, so which means that there must be, the object is not moving. Uh, if the if the source at the center is not moving, then then you couldn't use that. You couldn't use the old explanation for the orbit not closing. And but here actually you see the orbit has now closed. Why is it closed? That is because the object that is the, the orbit that you see here is not the Newtonian orbit, but the general relativistic orbit, which has been plotted, uh, which takes into account the precision of the perihelion. So this is a most marvelous observation. Right. So you've got a star. 24,000 light years away, uh, which is moving around the center of the galaxy. And then you have invoked general relativity to explain its motion in detail. So this is really, really good. Okay, so, so you see that and how much is the precession? It is 12.1 arc minute per orbit. And you see that the orbit, um, the orbit takes about 17 years. Right, so instead of getting 30, 43 arc seconds per century, so you're getting 12.1 arc minute. And that is because the, the black hole here is so massive and you're approaching so closely. So this is just a picture of that supermassive black hole at the orbit of S2 and it comes closer as distance. And here it, and <coughs> that is where you can see the precession. And uh, so if you, uh, so we have finished more than one orbit now, but if you wait for a hundred years or so, then you'll actually see the orbit persisting in the sky, which is shown here. And I'm sure you'll all agree with me that this is an incredibly beautiful observation. So now I make a quick jump to an active galaxy. So, so this involves all kinds of X-ray astronomy, but I will just give you a flavor of the arguments. So our galaxy is, by definition, a normal galaxy. It is dominated by light from the stars. Um, and then we have found a supermassive black hole. Clearly, the supermassive black hole is not very active 
if it were, we would all be, we would not have been born at all because uh, there will be too much radiation for anybody like us to survive. And so now I'm going to talk about an active galaxy, MCG 63015. Right, so, so now uh, we are going to talk about the X-ray emission. And when you look at, uh, <clears throat> when you look at the X-ray emission from um, an active galaxy, in the first approximation, it is a power law. Everybody thought that it's a power law. Meaning if you plot log of the intensity against log of the photon energy, you will get a line with the negative slope. But when you look at it uh, with better resolution, then you'll find a spectrum has got a lot of complex structure and not shown the emission lines. And then the dominant emission line uh, is what is called the K line of IL. Okay, so, so what is the physics of the thing like this? So the idea is that you've got a supermassive black hole, which is swallowing matter from the stars of the galaxy in the manner that I explained yesterday, and then you form a disk. Now, the disk is quite hot with a temperature corresponding to kT is equal to 0.5 kV. And you see that this one is the famous uh, <clears throat> innermost uh, stable circular orbit. So you see that the disk, this is the outer orbit, and then as the matter, as things in the, the particle brush against other particles, they'll gradually sleep, it's a sweep, it's a sweep, it's a sweep, they come here, and then here there's a stable orbit. But if this is a Schwarzschild black hole, and then this stable orbit will occur at three times, at uh, six times the Schwarzschild radius, three times the Schwarzschild radius, six times, three times the Schwarzschild radius. And from here, the, as the particles move inwards, there will be no stable state, they'll just collapse onto the black hole. Right? So now, as the closer this orbit, the greater is the temperature of that orbit. And please remember, I told you yesterday, that if this peak is shorter black hole, if it were a curved black hole at, it, at the maximum spin, and then this would be just this would be much closer to the black hole at 1.25 times the Schwarzschild radius. Now the photons which are emitted by this one, they don't just escape to infinity. Some do, but not all do. And they interact with a hot gas which is present here. Uh, and then there's a lot of inverse cosmic scattering. And uh, some of the photons are reflected back to the disk and then they travel into the disk and again they go out. That's a, they are very complex processes which are worked on by Fabian and others over a decade. Um, and then they fully determine the structure, the spectrum that you see here. Now, uh, please remember that if I got a line like this, a spectral line like this, this has got energy of about 6.7 kV. Uh, then uh, what happens is that because the accretion disk is rotating, so if you had a line which is emitted like this at a specific wavelength, uh, would be broadened like this with two halves. And uh, so you see that uh, uh, accretion disk is rotating. If I'm looking at it from somewhere here, then you'll see that the highest velocity will be here. Supposing it is rotating clockwise, the matter here will be traveling towards you, the matter here will be traveling away from you. So you'll get a Doppler effect. The velocity here is much higher than the velocity here. And so the net effect in the Newtonian case is that you will get a two hot structure like this. But uh, if you invoke special relativity, then the two hot, what happens? I told you about this relativistic boosting of the radiation. And because of that, uh, the, the, the radiation which is emitted towards you uh, is boosted relatively away, away from you. And therefore, out of these two things, the hot which corresponds to radiation in this direction is much brighter than the other one. But then there is a transverse Doppler effect. The Doppler effect that we are normally used to is only uh, because of motion along and away from the line of sight. But if you take into account the transverse motion in special relativity, that also leads to a change in the wavelength and that has been taken into account here. And then there is a, <coughs> so there is a, there's an effect due to the gravitational redshift. Meaning that as photons travel towards you, uh, they're traveling away from the gravitational field of the black hole, and therefore they are, uh, so they, they will get redshifted. I also told you that photons which are close to the black hole, uh, they could go around and around and around many times before they escape. And so all that has got to be taken into account, and when you do that, 
Uh, so you get a light like this. So this light here, one straight thing, it gets expanded into lights like like this. Right. So uh, then you could you could work out the details. Uh, what happens if the Schwarzschild black hole? Okay. And then and what happens if it is a Schwarzschild black hole? And what happens if the curved black hole? So we are again back. Uh, this is a curved black hole. So we are again back to our ISCO. How so? You see that the emission line itself is, as I told you, is about 6.7 kV. And then uh, the closer it is emitted to the black hole, the more it will get redshifted. Now, uh, in a Schwarzschild black hole, the innermost orbit from where you could have the emission is at three times uh, the Schwarzschild radius. Whereas in the Kerr case, so you can go much closer, 1.25 times. So it should mean that you'll get a much greater redshift for a photon which is coming to you from a curved black hole, from the vicinity of a curved black hole rather than a Schwarzschild black hole. So you see that the Schwarzschild black hole goes like this, and the curved black hole is a completely different profile. This is the old uh, calculation. So there is a galaxy called HCG 63015. It's a Seifert galaxy. It has got a broad emission line. And then uh, it was first observed. Uh, it has been observed for a long time. And this is an observation which was reported in 2000 by Adi Fabian, who's a very famous uh, X-ray astronomer uh, of our time. And then you'll see that this fit has been made to it. And it looks like a Schwarzschild line. Surface. But you see how uh, how big the iron and the, the, uh, the error bars are. And making a fit to the error bars is very difficult. But this seems to establish that there is a black hole at the center of FCG 3015. So now this is a this is a thing which has made much later, where much greater accuracy is possible, February 2002. Uh, and then you see that now the line seems to be actually fitting, uh, actually uh, uh, more uh, like the line due to a curved black hole. And in the next one, so this is a very beautiful thing which comes from the Japanese observatory Suzaku and XMF Newton. And, and then you see how beautifully the line has been fit to the curved black hole. Okay, so we see, uh, therefore, that we are established that there's a spinning black hole at the center of the galaxy MCG 6315. Now, unfortunately, uh, the, uh, I mean, it is, this is a very good explanation, but there are, in principle, there are explanations uh, which could provide this kind of a thing without there being a curved black hole of the center. I mean, it could be anything at all. Uh, and then you need a massive object there, but you know, then you can do this. But it seems that the balance of the evidence points to the existence of a rotating black hole at the center of the galaxy. Okay, so now these are not the only ways. I consider two extreme cases, one where you use X-ray astronomy, and which really can't be used freely with other galaxies because they are much further away and you don't have accurate X-ray measurements with them. Uh, uh, and then as they get further away, you could look at the motion of stars, but that becomes much, much more accurate. But you have got different techniques which are used. And this is a, this is a table. This is from about five years ago or seven years ago, I think. And there were so many galaxies in which a black hole was found to exist. Now, that has gone up to about 100 supermassive black holes now. I looked it up a couple of days ago. I didn't get the time to have that thing here. And these are measured by different things. So what has happened is that you have got measurements of the mass measurements and a few other measurements for uh, these black holes. <clears throat> and then so the question is, are there any systematics? And everybody's agreed that there must be supermassive black holes in the center of the galaxy. And they are also agreed that the black holes have been found. So the question is whether um, <coughs> are there any systematics? Meaning one black hole, we know the mass, but is the black hole related to the is the black hole related uh, uh, to our properties of the galaxy? So there are um, this was by Ferrarese and Ford uh, many years ago, and uh, Laura Ferrarese. What she had done was that you see here is the mass of the black hole on the y-axis. And here's the mass of the bulge of the galaxy. You know that a spiral galaxy has got a, or a lenticular has got a bulge and a disk, plus spiral arms of the spiral galaxy. So 
you can you can get the luminosity of the parish. So which you could convert to mass, which has not been done here. So it seems that if you look at this plot, you can pass a fairly good straight line through it. And therefore, it seems that the black hole uh, that the black hole is related to bulge luminosity, and therefore the bulge mass of the galaxy or mass of the bulge of the galaxy. So which would mean that the formation of the black hole is related to the formation of the bulk of the galaxy. And here is other observations. In fact, this is a much tighter plot, where you plot log, log of the mass against log of the central dispersion velocity of the stars. And you get a pretty tight plot here, but the, the explanation for why this occurs is not completely clear. And so, so now, uh, given all this data, I mean, there are any number of these kind of plots. Sulanshu Barwe and I have discovered a fundamental place for these kinds of things, but I have no time to go into it. So the question now is, um, how do you form the supermassive black holes? So I, the processes are very complex. And all that I can do is to give you a very, very quick um, summary of it. And so, you see, one, one very important observation, and people used to think that you form seed supermassive black holes in the past. When you get the early stages of the universe, when the galaxies are just forming, you form the seed supermassive black holes. And then these black holes keep uh, <coughs> swallowing mass and emitting at the elliptic level. They, let's say that a black hole swallows roughly one star per year uh, at the start of the mass like the sun for purposes of calculation. Then it takes you the eight years, the 100 billion years, if you swallowed, its mass should have increased by 100 million times the mass of the sun. In the billion years, it would increase by a factor of 10 to the 9. So it seems reasonable to imagine that you form seed black holes in the far past, and then they go on a creating matter of the galaxy and grow at the rate of about one solar mass per year. And then now they're down to 10 to the 9 solar masses. The problem is that the problem with this argument. Is that the black hole at the center of our galaxy and black holes at the center of galaxies close to us, uh, where we have made measurements, are uh, only about 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 solar masses. And then the really massive ones um, are very far away. And so, with the really massive ones, mm -hmm. 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 solar masses, are expected to have been formed in the early stages of the universe. So, then this whole argument, they first form a seed black hole. And then you, uh, from that, you continue accretion to get a black hole, falls flat on its face. You can't do that. You have to learn how to make supermassive black holes very quickly um, in the first phases of the universe. And that has not, an, I mean, there's a very great deal of work which has been done. But there's nothing which, which I can tell you in assurance. Um, it's just a few sentences. Uh, here are some of the mechanisms possible. <clears throat> so here I've got what is called a dark matter halo, you'll be told about it in cosmology. And inside that, there's a gas. So no galaxy is formed here. Now, the gas cools very slowly, forming a stable disk. And then the first stars are born. And because there are no heavy metals in it, it is nothing heavier than helium, except in trace quantities. So therefore, the masses of the stars which are formed are very large. 304, they find the solar masses. And then these, when they explode, will leave black holes, which are mass of about, uh, <clears throat> if the star is more massive than 300 solar masses, it collapses into a black hole with 200 times the mass of the sun. And in such a black hole, we should do the accretion. The other one is that the, the gas collapses. It's, uh, first, you have got the gas which is unstable and collapses to form a one supermassive star, the million solar masses, and then collapses into a black hole, which grows. And the third one is where there is no collapse to a single black hole, but there is a locally unstable gas. Uh, it forms stars. The stars evolve to leave behind black holes. And then these black holes, they bang into each other, and then they go to the center of the galaxy and so form a supermassive black hole. A massive black hole at least, which later forms a supermassive black hole. But as I told you, uh, these things are all there. And here's the other picture which shows you uh, that uh, you've got uh, the early universe, and then you've got a barely formed galaxy, and 
is a black hole inside. The black hole could be dominant and it guides the formation of the rest of the galaxy to form a galaxy like the present time. The other one is when the black hole which is formed is small and it is the galaxy which it, it just causes small things to the galaxy. The galaxy grows and afterwards the gas, the black hole grows rapidly. And here they are growing together more or less. And so these are the, uh, I would mean, just to tell you, not to explain to you how a supernatural black hole is formed, but just to show you what are the kind of ideas that people have. All right. So I've done with supermassive black holes. So I've got about 10 minutes left with me. And so I'm exceeding the time by 10 minutes, but that's all right. So let us now come back to... See, I forgot to stop halfway to ask questions. Now there's only 10 minutes left, so let me not stop here. Let me just continue. So, <clears throat> so what have we learned? That a black hole has infinite matter and conventional density. Then uh, these are singularities. And how do we deal with the singularities mathematically? That's one question. The other question was, um, if we, we predict objects like this, uh, do, do such really black holes exist? Or they're just artifacts of the simplifying assumptions of the theory? Right? So have they been observed? And we can say, yes, they have been observed. Okay, And then what about the Big Bang singularity? Does it because, assume because of the Assume homogeneity and isotropy. Now, this, this I have already, I mean, I should have put this uh, slide right at the beginning, but I forgot to do so. But we already observed. Has it been observed? Yes, we observed black holes for all practical purposes. It's uh, supermassive black holes. And then we have definitely observed black holes uh, in the framework of general relativity uh, in, in the gravitational wave observations. Okay, so, so now uh, let me come to this extremely theoretical work which Roger Penrose did in 1965. The question he was asking was the following. The Schwarzschild black hole is purely is spherical symmetric and you get a singularity. Uh, the curved black hole is actually symmetric and then you get a singularity. So is the singularity occurring because of the assume very simple symmetric structure for these objects, or does the singularity occur uh, in general relativity uh, as a, it is not an artifact, and it will always occur in general relativity under very general conditions. So that's what the thing which Petros, Roger Petros was a mathematician, uh, and then he had slowly drifted out relativity because of the influence of Denis Shyama. Lady Shyama was a supervisor of many people, including Martin Rees and Stephen Hawking. And uh, so Penrose got influenced by him, and then he started working on this. And uh, then when Penrose was trying to prove, he wanted to prove theorems in a very general way. And And what, what uh, Rajasthan's work does, you've got something called, uh, <coughs> you've got the Roberts, you've you got the Friedman equations, which tell you how the universe evolves from this thing. And uh, so you can, you can consider the universe as a gas and uh, the made up of galaxies. And what Rajasthan's work did, did was that he gave uh, a very general equation, uh, which, which shows you, uh, how the scale of the universe will be changing uh, in the presence not only of matter, uh, like, the, like the Feynman equations, but also if the matter had stress and if it had rotation. And here is a cosmological constant. Unfortunately, I cannot explain to you anything more about this beautiful equation. And uh, he derived that equation in 1953. Uh, and he has worked by himself. There was no guidance, there was no nothing, and there was nothing. Okay? And, uh, <clears throat> and so the, this equation was directed to cosmology. It applies to various theories of gravity, uh, including general relativity. It provides general conditions under which a singularity is present in the finite past. And matter and shear are suited convergence for rotation and the repulsive effect. And uh, the equation provides conditions for a focusing effect. So then Pedro's in 1965 
gave the first signal in theorem. And he said that in the space time, if any space time contains a tall, compact Cauchy of the surface and a closed future trap surface, and if the convergence condition is satisfied, uh, then, then you have got a, a future incomplete null zero set. So what does all this mean? Uh, this one, uh, a Cauchy of the surface is there is a very general condition for the existence of solutions. And you see that uh, we have got P is equal to P is equal to constant surfaces, and this is the counterpart uh, when you have a curved space time. And then a future trap surface is simply our event horizon. And this one corresponds to, because of the Einstein's equation, it corresponds to a positivity condition. Okay, so uh, energy is positive, total energy. So uh, after Spedwell gave his first theorem, then he had a long collaboration uh, with Stephen Hawking and using Pedro's and Hawking in this picture. Uh, and then, uh, so they gave a series of theorems. And then Pedro's also, then the other people who gave similarity theorems include Robert Garrosh, uh, uh, Robert Garrosh, uh, and from she was from Chicago, and GFR Ellis from South Africa. Okay, so, uh, so there, this on this series of uh, singularity theorems, they established that the existence of a singularity is endemic to general relativity. It is not because of any assumed conditions whatsoever. Singularity, under very general conditions, singularities must always occur. And Penrose uh, got the Nobel Prize uh, in last year for his work. So um, the last part, black holes and one more. Now, you remember, uh, so we have got a black hole and then uh, the Schwarzschild solution. So, if you remember, I told you something which are called Fickelschein coordinates. Uh, just to show that there is no singularity at R is equal to GM. And uh, so, this is a generalization of the Fickelschein coordinates, uh, which I could not mention before, which is called the Kruskal coordinates, Kruskal Zakirish coordinates. And in these coordinates, you see that uh, these, uh, these, these lines that you see at 45 degrees to the diagram, to the axis, so, so these are null rays, these are light rays. So these are, these are light rays which are going to infinity. And this light ray is coming from infinitely far away and it is falling here. And because of the peculiarity of the coordinate system, the singularity at R is equal to zero has been stretched out into this blue line here. So it is a, it's actually a, 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 it's a hyperbola. So that is nothing to do with the nature of the singularity. It is only to do with the complex coordinate system which have been used. So what is this? So this is, if you had a black hole and you've got the infinite space around it, then this orange part of the diagram explains that space. It is just a representation of that space. So here the lines are coming from infinity. But what happens to these lines? Okay, you see that um, they are just, they're abruptly ending here. And this is a null surface. It is not a singularity. So they said that why should this, is a purely mathematical question, is that on the one side I got lines which are going to minus infinity and hitting the singularity because they are the objects which are coming from far away and falling into the black hole. Whereas these other lines, they're going to infinity but they're just coming. So what happened? Why is this, why is this region black? So when you've got a geodesic like this, where it is not coming from a singularity, then you say that this space is not complete. You have to complete it. And the simplest way of completing this process, space uh, is to reflect the upper half, the upper everything below above the dark sun, you reflect it in the diagram. And then what do you get? You get this space which is maximum, when you get, it can no longer further be extended. And that space has got two singularities. One is the black hole singularity, which is in the future, meaning that all particles and light rays will come and fall into it. And then there's another singularity, exactly like the black hole singularity, except that it is in the past. And now you will see that all lines, either the end of the singularity, come from infinity, at the end of the singularity or the beginning of the singularity. And so therefore, in fact, there's another beautiful version of this, the Petrol diagram, which I showed you long ago, 
where you have pulled the infinity to a finite distance by a conformal transformation. So otherwise, this diagram is the same, contain the same information as the diagram. Though it is more convenient for studying the structure of infinity. And then you see here, uh, so, uh, so what is a white hole? A white hole is an object uh, from which matter can come out, but nothing can fall into it. So if you have a white hole somewhere, you'd be like just an exploding thing. There's an energy coming out of it. White holes have not been observed. So, so far, it is just a pure construct. But an interesting thing is that if I start here at infinity, you see, I end up here, there's singularity. Start here, there's singularity. But if I go from there to there, you see that this is one infinite space. And this is an adjacent infinite space. But the two are not connected. So the question is, can I go from there to there? Because there's no singularity here. Can I go from there to there? Unfortunately, you will find that this line is space-like. And if, in order to go um, at all, um, you must travel at least on the null rays. And all the null rays you'll find that they have start or end at a singularity. Right? So if you could go, if you could cross this one, and this is the einstein rose bridge. First, Einstein worked on it a long time ago. So you see that in some ways, this is a singularity here. And uh, this is a matter of falling into the singularity. So you are you are falling into the singularity. Um, but then here you seem to be coming out of it. Okay, so so does, does such a bridge exist? I mean, so this is what you call an einstein rose bridge. And if you could have, there is no way in which you can have it now. If there are the certain conditions, if certain things are possible, then the bridge is possible. But that has not been achieved here. And then you see that if you had this bridge, now this, just imagine this particular topology, where the space is indicated by this particular strip here. So if the strip were just, it goes from infinity to infinity, and then you would go, you could go from infinity along the thing and take infinite time and go there. Right? So if you want to reach here, from here, then you want to go all the way around. And you may never be able to make it in the lifetime of the universe. But supposing you've got an einstein rosen bridge here. Okay, so then if you want to reach this point from here, instead of going there, so just go to the bridge and come here. So that is why when you see, when you, when you see things like Star Wars or when you see um, Star Trek, okay, they constantly keep going very far away. And the idea is they take a bridge like this. But as far as we are concerned, the bridges become meaningful only if you can travel faster than light, which according to our current best theory, we cannot do. And so therefore, traveling to distant places is still a dream. So, thank you. Yeah, there is somebody called Neil Wadoria who has a question. Somebody called Neil Wadoria. Yes, yeah. The, so my question is related to the plot that you showed for the luminosity and the mass of the supermassive black hole. Yes. So, so uh, what I found was that uh, the experimental observations, they yeah. were very nice upper bound. However, uh, there is a lot of error in the yes. lower. Uh, yeah. so what, because, what is the reason? No, no, see the reason, see it's a, the, all these measurements, uh, uh, they're a very complex set of measurements going into determining these values. Okay, so, so you'll find in some cases that uh, it's a short error bar where the observations are much better, and the error bars also are symmetric. In other cases, the upper, they, are, they are entirely because of the observational tricks, the observing techniques which are used, and uh, because of the difficulties of making the observations. In this case, for example, the error bar is very small, because this is probably a galaxy which is much closer, and that it has been observed using techniques which are much more accurate. Because each observation is made, there are four or five or six different techniques which are used, and, uh, Depends on which one you use, you get better error bars. But that's a very good question. Okay, Ayush Gar. 
Hello. Yeah, Ayush. Am I audible, sir? Yes, please. Uh, sir, in the last slide, when you had a conversation about the white holes and the black holes, we yeah. have consider them like uh, an object. Uh, as we have seen the lights coming out of the stars, which are which are the source of generation of those photons. So, yes. uh, as you have said that uh, the white holes are the uh, the objects which emits the light itself. They yes. are not absorbing it. So, so far we have uh, studied and observed a black hole. And we had an image of it. So why can't we had an image of a, of an object which is the continuous source of an photons and the light? Yeah. So it's a lot of the question. Why can't we? Why can't we uh, observe the uh, light coming out of the white holes, which is the continuous source of? Uh, yeah. It is. You see that if it were there, you would not have observed it. Uh, but we we simply are not found. Okay. We are not found any object which could correspond to a white hole. That's the observation situation. So we should mean that probably uh, maybe they don't exist. So that's the theoretical aspect only. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Our last question. Uh, this is by Javni. Javni, Brahma, but. Uh, hello. Can you yeah? hear me? Yes. Sir, I wanted to ask that uh, what will be the difference between effect of uh, any effect on any matter if uh, it falls into a black hole having mass few times more than sun and uh, another black hole mass having more than million times more than sun. Yeah. So you see, you should be able to work that out yourself. Is it? Uh, supposing it was Newton's theory, right? So you can just work it out. What happens is that. It is a point particle falling, as I told you, that there is absolutely no scale. Right, so uh, the spatial radius of a if it is a, if it, a black hole with one solar mass, spatial is three kilometers. The other black hole has forty solar masses, which is one hundred and twenty kilometers. Right. So what happens here? In one case, it's one kilometer. In the other three kilometers. Other case will happen one hundred and twenty kilometers. There is absolutely no scale there. All right. Since the questions are all done, uh, so we can stop the lecture. Thank you.